Chris House. Here to introduce you to our sixth episode of this current series online. If you're checking out, uh, checking this out for the first time today, then a special warm welcome to you. We are a Church of England congregation at the heart of Southport, with a heart for Southport. Uh, we connect here in a bunch of different ways. Uh, we're about building community, growing together, seeking the power of God to bring hope in relevant ways to today's society, seeing lives changed with Jesus at the centre. As we move into this episode, I, I want to invite you to take a moment uh, to just set aside this time uh, to be still and to prepare your heart and mind to step further into the presence of God, wherever you might be watching this from. Uh, we'll, we'll have a psalm on the screen and I'd love to encourage you, uh, you to pray uh, that you would find the faith and hope to hear the Holy Spirit of God speak to you today as we carry on this series. After we've prayed for a bit, uh, we'll head over live to hear this week's message from our Sunday morning in-person gathering, have some music, and before we finish, we'll hear some ways that you can continue to connect with CCS. But before all that, here's a little bit of who we are.
is from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, and then 11 to 16. If you want to follow it in the Blue Bibles, it's page 442, that's 442, or it's on the screen. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement on their faces on the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, then the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so there's no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal this land their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Amen. Morning, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Tabs. I, uh, I work uh, in schools in Southport. My wife and I lead a charity uh, who uh, we do a lot of work in different ways with young people. Um, but just to add to what Angie was praying for, the need is great amongst children and people. The need for, for healing, the need for what we do. As someone who, uh, part of many things, I guess, surveys hundreds of young people every week on their well-being. I can tell you that there is real, real need. Uh, but anyway, for us today, um, how are you doing, Christchurch? How are we today? Okay, we're all right, we're fine. Very British answers there <laughs> to a very English question. Yeah, we're okay, thanks. Yeah, all right, fine. Yeah. Mm. Here's another British question for you. What's the longest queue you've ever joined? Anyone? What's the longest queue you've ever been in? Go on, how long was passport control entering China, Matthew? A 500 people. How long did you have to wait? Two hours. That's quite long. Anyone beat two hours for a queue? Alton Towers. How long is your, your longest Alton Towers queue, Sam? I think I've done two and a half hours for a, for a ride on Towers, yeah. Anyone else beat that? What about the, uh, during the pandemic, queuing up for your toilet roll at the supermarket? <laughs> How long did you do that for? <laughs> Didn't do that, oh no, no, no. We, uh, we got delivery, yeah. <laughs> toilet roll delivery, yeah. Or uh, on the phone at, to, on a call centre, you know, you've done that, haven't you? You've waited forever. Uh, to hear from the bank about whatever, I don't know. Um, but what I wondered is how long would you be prepared to wait, Christchurch, if, if we made you queue at the door to get in? How long would you be prepared to queue for church? 
Now, obviously, we are the church, so we are church wherever we are, um, but how long would you be prepared to queue to gather and worship together? What about if we made you queue up right down Lord Street, outside the, the Atkinson, down to uh, the Vincent or whatever, and, and how, long, how long would you stand in the queue? I've been to a few churches where they do queue to get into church. Um, sometimes, maybe not always for the best reasons, um, like whichever big name speaker there is that week or, or whatever, but um, it, it does look quite cool, people queuing up outside church, got to say. Um, or those of us that have been to New Wine Festival, um, other festivals do exist, believe it or not, um, but we, we go as our little church group and we send a few people ahead of time to the worship gathering with their, their coats and their bags to spread out across some chairs and they sit and they wait for half an hour or longer, maybe Rob, I don't know, something like that, um, and they wait for the gathering of worship. You may or may not have heard, though, about the two-week-long, unplanned, spontaneous worship service that happened back in February this year uh, in a Christian college called Asbury University, named after a Methodist missionary, we think. Um, uh, it was in a small town in Kentucky in the United States. And this, I say small town, they have about 6,000 residents, which is like 7% of Southport, really small place, um, and they, they had this worship service that just sort of started after their weekly prayer service that they did very diligently. And after that, they just sort of stuck around and felt compelled to pray and worship. Um, and people heard about it, and it just kind of kept on going throughout the day and night. And people traveled from right around the world to this unplanned, spontaneous time of worship to the point that there were queues out the doors, and they ended up at its height with 100,000 people trying to attend this from right around the world in this tiny little town back in February. It lasted over two weeks, and people were queuing up for days to get into this town just to gather and worship God. What I find really inspiring about it is that all these people, uh, were, they were queuing up to worship God. They weren't queuing up to receive a blessing or anything. They were queuing up to give praise to God together, to gather and to worship him. I think that's really, really cool. We might be prepared to, I don't know, queue up to receive something. Often when we queue up, we're queuing up because we're going to get something in return. But... How often are we prepared to queue up in order to give something to someone? And what if that something was worship and that someone was God? Today's theme is about humility. It's about finding humility at such a time as this. And I find this sort of stuff really, really humbling. This, this college had their weekly chapel service, um, but instead of finishing up with their final song, the gospel choir just kept on singing, uh, and then people had classes that they were supposed to have gone to um, at 11 o'clock, but some of them went, some of them stayed, um, and there's all sorts of things online about it, um, and uh, like there's interviews um, countless news stories, reports, YouTube videos. Uh, apparently, Asprey Revival got 68 million views on TikTok. I'm not a TikToker, but from those who TikTok, apparently that's quite a lot. Um, one student had an 11 a.m. class that they were supposed to go to, um, but she uh, said in an interview, my heart was just hurting. I was like, God, I just need to stay and repent. It's, and it's the first time that I've ever skipped a class in my life. Christian kids, eh? Um, something just seemed to shift. Another student shared about how she, uh, she was just like, how can I stand in your presence, God? Because you are here right now, and it's the most physical I've ever felt the presence of God. People started coming back to the chapel after their lunch and found people were still there. And it just kind of went on and on and on, all this worshipping and praying, this place filled for over two weeks. It just took off. 
even today, there's reports of people who went, who have gone back to where they're from, and they're experiencing God do similar uh, moves of his spirit, particularly amongst young people, particularly on university campuses. And it reminds me a lot of what we heard in our reading today from uh, the Chronicles about Solomon's temple. It took King Solomon seven years of diligent hard work to build the Lord's temple in Israel. And when he finished up building this huge, glorious unit of a temple, Solomon dedicated the temple in prayer. And then something truly extraordinary happened. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces on the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. I just think that's the most incredible picture. Like God has come and filled this temple with his presence, so much so the, the people couldn't get in. No matter how desperate they were to do so, and they're all just queued up outside, falling to the ground and bowing in prayer. Even that posture of bowing before God is such a powerful display of humility. Verse 14 in the passage is, is a verse that has kept on coming up here at Christchurch quite a lot for a few of us um, over the years, and particularly recently in some of the prayer meetings we've been having and things like that. This verse of a promise to God's people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. How much do we need that healing? And it comes at that point when God's presence fills the temple. The people of Israel who uh, King Solomon was leading after his father, King David, they're overwhelmed by the presence of God in their temple. They are humbled. They are praying. They are uh, they're, they're like, God, we want to turn away from our unholy, selfish actions and be sold out for you and you only. And what we see there is their humility and their dedication of themselves to God. And it's like, God's like, yeah, okay, that's good. I'm uh, going to come and fill your temple, and it'll be more amazing than anything you've ever known. So when they stuck to what, to, to what God was saying about humility here, God came and lived with them in the temple, which is pretty great, really. But actually, um, because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we get an even better deal. We get any, something way even better than this if we humble ourselves and pray. We don't just get to experience physical places filled with God's presence and people queuing out the door uh, and revival tourists from all around the world. We get to know God filling each of us personally, filling our lives with his presence too. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he gave us a way which we can encounter the power and the beauty of God's presence in our hearts, in our bodies, wherever we go. We don't need a temple because each of us are walking temples of God. We just need to ask his presence, ask God to fill us with his presence. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, first letter, um, very much in the context of how we use our bodies, um, he, he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? We are walking temples of the Holy Spirit wherever we go. And so the question is, how can I experience the presence of God? 
How can I? The answer is actually really quite simple. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's, uh, it's ridiculously difficult. Uh, it's countercultural. It's kind of the opposite to how we think and act in uh, today's society. Um, but it's really simple. The answer is humility. To take the focus off ourselves and onto God. Humility is actually something which, believe it or not, I have been asked to speak on quite a few times. Ironic, um, I know. Or at least that's what my darling wife, Hetty, thinks. Um, or at least that's what I think the laughter means whenever I come home and tell her they've asked me to speak on me, to speak on humility again. Um, but every time I've had to explore this concept of humility with people, I'm struck by the thought of how different our lives would be if we spent less time thinking about ourselves and more time thinking about others, thinking about God. How different would our mental and emotional health be if we did that? See, sometimes we hear the word humility and we, we mistake it for kind of a, a worldly definition of that, which is to kind of put ourselves down, to think less of ourselves, like a, a counteraction to, that, to the thinking that we're the bee's knees, that we're all that. And to be honest, I really don't think that's what humility is about. In fact, when we do that, it just leads to more and more unhealthy thoughts. It leads to low self-esteem. And we're still stuck with the focus all being on ourselves. But my, my favourite quote that I, I always go to when I think about humility uh, is from a, a, a gospel preacher and an author called Tim Keller, who passed away actually a couple of days ago. And so we really want to pray for him and his family, um, but also remember and honour him um, with some of his very wise words. Um, and I was going to use them anyway, actually, because they're pretty good. Uh, he says, the heart of the Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. Yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and sniveling. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I do not think more of myself, nor less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. Whenever I first heard that quote, I got my phone out in the sermon I was sat in and took a picture of the screen. You're very welcome to do that if you want. Um, we'll keep it on for just, yeah, good. Okay. Um, one of, one of the, uh, this attitude of selflessness now, this incredibly simple yet ridiculously challenging answer to the question of how we, as walking temples of the Holy Spirit, can experience the presence of God being more humble, is something that I think goes against the grain of how we act in Western society and in our ways of doing church. Whereas I find the few encounters that I've been priv privileged to have with persecuted Christians around the world uh, show a much, much more inspiring and humbling way of Christian living. Like, honestly, there's times where I've met Christians from illegal underground churches uh, in places like, from places, I've not been to these places, but from places like Iran, China, Sri Lanka, and having them pray for me and my friends, despite everything that they live through, those have been some of the most moving moments of my work with God. There's a, an American megachurch pastor called Francis Chan, who I think gives one of the best accounts of visiting persecuted churches in, uh, as, as a Western Christian and being humbled and, to be honest, put in his place by what he experienced. 
Uh, he took a sabbatical to go and uh, visit uh, Christians in uh, India, Thailand, and then ended up in China. Uh, he encountered all sorts of incredible stories of the extent at which people go to to express their faith with incredible miracles of God saving them from near-death experiences whilst they're being tortured in prison and stuff like that. And with one group of leaders and, and students in China, Francis asked them to share about the persecution uh, that they had endured, and they all just looked at him, confused. And they were like, well, of course we experience persecution. Doesn't everyone? Didn't Jesus say that they would persecute us just as they persecuted him? Isn't that a part of everyday life? And then apparently one guy uh, decided to humour him um, and tells a story of something which I'm going to read as an extract from uh, Fran Francis's book on this. Um, he said, one of the guys said that some government officials showed up while they were meeting and they thought, there's only three of them and there's 14 of us. So they all screamed and started running and the officials started firing their guns, but these students knew they were bluffing by shooting in the air. Uh, they had been taught in their training to keep running, so that's exactly what they did. And as this guy is telling me this story, he said, the whole thing was so cool. As these students were sharing, I was struck by their joy. They were laughing at each other's stories, uh, and they, they shared a genuine happiness. I guess I was expecting them to be devoted and passionate, which they were, but I wasn't expecting the joy. Then they asked me why it was so strange for me to hear their stories. And I had to explain that things are a little bit different where I come from. I told them that when most Americans talk about church, they're referring to a building. I explained that we have a ton of these buildings and that you can choose which one you want to attend. Then I told them that people might attend one for a while but when they find another one with better music, they'll switch. That's when these students started laughing hysterically. I told them that one church, if one church offers better childcare than another, then a lot of parents are likely to switch. The students started laughing even harder. I explained that sometimes people will switch if the service times are more convenient or if one speaker uh, is better than another. The students were dying with laughter at this point. I felt like I was doing a comedy routine, but all I was trying to do was explain the American consumerist model of church to the underground church in China. When you hear the passion and the faith of these underground churches. Don't you just, like, I, I get lost for words. I just, like, we are far from being an American megachurch here at Christchurch, but I can't be the only one who hears these stories and thinks, wow, we are so stuck we are so stuck in this deeply ingrained mentality of consumerism in Western churches. Turning up, attending, to be fed, complaining when things aren't to our tastes, always thinking we've got the right answers, always wanting my own way, falling out over all sorts of things. The decor of the building, like the carpet, I really don't like the carpet here, I'm just saying. Um, not having the humility to, to let our guards down, to step out of our comfort zones, to turn from our selfish ways and just honestly seek the presence of God without our stuff getting in the way. 
I honestly, I, I don't mean to offend anyone here. I'm preaching to myself more than anyone. I, I'm as bad as the next person. But the things that we bicker about, the excuses we make for not getting stuck in with serving God and his mission to Southport. And then I, I wonder how much the Apostle Paul would have to say about the things that we do do and our motives for doing them. When he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I am so humbled when I think of how much of a laughing stock we must be to half the persecuted churches around the world. And yet, whilst we're getting our knickers in a twist, there are churches around the world who are truly discovering what it means to humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. In their desperation and their true reliance on God, they're experiencing hearing him from heaven, dramatically answering their prayers, pouring out his forgiveness and his mercy on them, and moving in power, healing their land, with an endless queue of people coming to faith. Think about a wrap-up before the double-edged sword digs in any deeper. Um, it's so clear... It's so clear how when God's people humble themselves and pray, they bow before him. They dedicate themselves to the point that it's no longer about themselves, but it's about God's kingdom. That's when we see God move. That's when we experience God's power and presence. That's something worth queuing up for and waiting for as long as it takes. I wanted, to, I wanted to conclude with what I know to be the best example of humility, and that is, like in all Sunday school lessons, the answer is Jesus. Jesus with whom we are united with, with whom we share the Holy Spirit. I shared a little bit of what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to read a bit more of it. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, thinking our ways best, our agenda, having the right answers. Rather, in humility, Value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider himself equal to God, something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Are we ready, Christchurch, for such a time as this, to step out of our own bubble, our own wants, our own needs, our own desires, our own agenda, our own right answers, our own hurts, our own hang-ups, to confess our sinfulness, to humble ourselves, to think of ourselves less. Are we ready to dedicate ourselves to focusing on God and be filled with his presence as walking temples of the Holy Spirit? Are we ready at such a time as this to know freedom, to know that freedom and to live like we have never lived before. What are the everyday changes and steps we can take to live more humbly before our almighty God? Let's pray.
If my people, who are called by my name, if my people, who are called by my name, Christ Church, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. God, we cry out for that. We long for your presence, we long for your healing. We long to know you move in this nation. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We pray. We seek you. Come, Holy Spirit. Church starts praying, stronghold starts to break. Oh, oh, when we pray, there's a wall starts shaking, and the sound of praise. Nothing stays the same. Oh, oh, when we pray, all the world starts changing. As the church starts praying, stronghold starts to break. Oh, oh, when we pray, there's a wall starts shaking. Yeah.
Good stuff. I, uh, I really hope you've continued to sense God speak to you through our sixth episode of the series. Like always, if you'd like to take this week's message deeper and see it grow and shape your faith even more so, we've got some questions in the description for you to spend some time reflecting on, either on your own or in your personal reflections or, or together with others. Uh, growing together and supporting and challenging one another. And then if anything has spoken to you in this episode, do get in touch either through uh, CCS office or the YouTube comments. And remember, there's a bunch of uh, stuff to get involved with across the CCS family too, if you'd like to stay connected with us. If, if, you, if you'd like to connect with one of our missional communities, blessing our town of Southport, just contact the office. Or if you uh, if you want to keep in uh, keep up to date with all things CCS, you can you can get yourself on our weekly emails or check out this week's CCS news in the episode description or our social media channels. And on that note, uh, do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you do that, then I'll see you again next time. Thanks for joining us. Be blessed and be a blessing to others.